So let's uh, get going here. In the book of Exodus is where we are. We have uh, spent a few weeks already talking about um, uh, things like the, uh, the, the way that Pharaoh is set up in chapter 1 to be uh, lampooned because uh, he, from the moment that he says, hey, let's act smart, everything that he does uh, turns out to be foolish. Uh, we talked a little bit about the uh, sort of the, the nature of the oppression that the Israelites experienced when, you know, what kind of slaves they were and uh, how their circumstances declined there. Talked a good bit about uh, the birth of Moses and that experience. And then also um, those kind of formative experiences or character revealing experiences, I would say, of Moses' life there when he delivers the Hebrew from the Egyptian, when he delivers the Hebrew from the Hebrew, and then when he delivers the uh, uh, Jethro's daughters um, from the shepherds who were there. Uh, Moses is powerful. Moses is compassionate. But God bless him, Moses is going to be lost um, for his whole life. He'll never quite find uh, his particular place. Well, where we're going to pick up today is at the end of Exodus chapter 2, a couple of verses that I deliberately left out from our discussion the other day. So let me... Uh, let me read this particular passage here. This is Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Out of the slavery, uh, out of the slavery their cry for help rose up to God. God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites, and God took notice of them. This uh, last few verses here in uh, the second chapter of Exodus, it's revealing because it shows something that has been missing in the, the two chapters up until now. It, it's a fascinating thing, and you don't really quite catch it unless you really look closely. In their entire time of struggle here, the Israelites have not cried out to God. So from chapter 1, verse 1, until where we just were, the Israelites have not cried out at all. They have been languishing here in their oppression, and yet one thing the text never mentions, never mentions their praying to God for deliverance. Now this is matched by something else. God does not lift a finger to help the Israelites during all of this. Now, God may be providentially working behind the scenes, and you know, I think you could say that with the life of Moses and so forth, but in terms of explicit references to things that God does, God only does one thing in the entire first couple of chapters of Exodus. As the Israelites are descending into this terrible time of slavery, the sole thing that it attributes to God is it says that God gives the midwives houses, meaning families, because they take care of the children. I mentioned at the beginning of our series that the Israelites have grown in number, but they have forgotten who they really are. They have grown, they've descended into a point of chaos where, you know, it uses that verb to swarm. The place is swarming with Israelites. There, there are now a lot of them, but they've lost their identity. They don't have names anymore. It's just a mass of people. They don't really understand anymore who they are, and they have grown distant from God in the process. And yet God has kind of grown distant from them at the same time. All the way until that verse 23 of chapter 2 that I read. That's where things finally change. And you have to read this text carefully because it doesn't actually say in there that the Israelites cried out to God. It just says that they cry. Um, what it says in the text here, it says, after a long moan, it just... Oh, that kind of cry under their, uh, their, their, the weight of the slavery that they're experiencing. And the, the scene that it always reminds me of, and, and this will reveal that I have sons and not daughters, it's the, I can't remember which one of the Disney movies it is where the two witches, they're like debating over the blue and the pink. Is it Snow White or is it Cinderella? Or, or Sleeping Beauty. Uh, <laughs> is it Sleeping Beauty? Um, well... That would have been my third guess. <laughs> so, well, you remember how they're, they're doing their spells back and forth, and the, the, the colors from the spells starts to go out the chimney. 
and it rises up, and that's when the little messenger from, it's, it's the, the bad one, right? Uh, the, the one that my wife hates, she hated the new version of the movie there, um, Maleficent. Uh, Maleficent, um, she, you know, her little messenger bird sees that the, the colors have risen up like that and, and see, catches wind of it. The Israelites cry out. It doesn't say they cry out to God. And it gives the impression that almost like smoke that's wafting up there, it finally reaches heaven. Notice the way the text puts it. It says, they cried out, uh, out of the slavery, their cry for help rose up to God. It's almost as if it just winds its way up the chimney, finally makes its way up to heaven. And it's as if God sees it finally and then decides to intervene. I, I'll, I'll be honest, the entire exodus is accomplished in these three verses right here. Because once God sees the suffering of the people, and it's, it goes beyond seeing. It's got this just string of verbs that are attributed to God. Look at the way that it puts it. It says that um, it says uh, their cry for help rose up to God. God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant. God looked upon the Israelites, and this last line is just miserably translated. It says, and God took notice of them. It's not what the text says. It says, and God knew. The term know in here of that, you know, sort of sympathy and empathy put together, it's as if you've put yourself in their shoes and you've experienced it. From this moment, God has experienced the suffering of the Israelites. And it has just incensed him. And from this moment forward, the exodus is a fait accompli. It's done. It's just a matter of, you know, arranging the pieces. God experiences the suffering of his people and decides, I'm going to let my people go. And it will just be whether Moses and the Israelites and Pharaoh will decide to get in line. And one way or another, in the rest of the book, they're going to resist and resist and resist. But it's a little bit like my parenting philosophy. This is a contest of wills, and I'm going to win. You are going to lose. I mean, that, we were, we were I literally, we were talking with uh, our sons just earlier this week, and they were, we were seeing some other kids that were just misbehaving terribly. And we, we said, boys, I just, you know, we have to thank y'all. Y'all just did not do that to us. I mean, y'all were just really really good. And I, I said, of course, part of it was because we were bound and determined for the first three years of your lives, this is a war and we are going to win it. And once we had broken them, then I, we actually had just wonderful parenting. I mean, our parent, our kids were knuckleheads like every other you know, set of kids are, and they did stupid things like other kids do, but we didn't get a lot of that stuff. But part of it was just because... I'm sorry, I am more stubborn than you are, and I'm going to prove it. And there's an element of that in the Exodus. God has said, this is going to happen one way or another. And you can kick, and you can scream, and you can fight. But I have determined my people are going to be set free, and y'all are going to do it. This is the Exodus wrapped up in these couple of verses. Now, there's a significant turn in the text that happens in chapter 3, verse 1. In, uh, in Hebrew, there's an odd way of uh, arranging it. You know, not only is Hebrew written from right to left, but nearly every aspect of the Hebrew language is backwards from what you do in English. I just tell my students, you know, whatever it is in Hebrew, just flip it around and it will make more sense. Adjectives, it's just like, you know, the Romance languages, they put the adjective after the noun. If you just flip it, um, then it all looks right. What's really odd is they usually put the verb first in the sentence. And so when you, if you, the, there's a regular line that comes up in Hebrew, you know, Vayomer Adonai El Moshe. Vayomer is, and he said, Adonai, the Lord, El Moshe to Moses. Literally, it says, and he said, did the Lord to Moses. If you just flip everything around, it all becomes clear, um, which is, you know, maybe that was how it all got started. They just, you know, they were riding the wrong direction or something. Somebody thought they should have been going left or right, and it would have all been clear. Um, the, this is a line that starts with the noun. When they start with a noun, usually they're marking a significant break in the text. This next verse says, now Moses, 
We are at a turn because from this point forward, the exodus proper is going to begin. Look at the way the text begins here. I confess I'm not exactly convinced that God has a sense of humor. Usually when people say that God has a sense of humor, I, and I know it's kind of one of those southern things where you look at somebody and say, you know, God bless them. You know, bless your heart. That's the kind of God has a sense of humor to have created someone like that person who's doing that. I, I, if, you, if you really are omniscient and know everything, you know all the punchlines in advance, then I'm not really convinced that, um, the, uh, that God has a sense of humor. But the sort of perverse sense of humor that I have always finds something humorous in this part. As I read the text, you ever had that moment when uh, you, you were going to scare someone and they were getting closer and closer and you begin to just almost tremble with anticipation because you know you've got them. I, 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 I do this far too often to my beloved wife. It's the reason why when we get to heaven, she'll be sitting in Jesus' lap while I'm outside, you know, uh, looking in from the, the outskirts somewhere because of all that she's had to endure from me. I, I did this to her just the other night. In fact, we went to Brewster's to get ice cream. And there was a, uh, an exterminator truck, and it had a giant spider that was like a stuffed animal type spider on the rear uh, of the cab of the truck. My wife, God bless her, she hates spiders. She just can't stand them. And so when my, my younger son and I saw it, because we had driven separately, we walked over, and he doesn't like them much either, and he sort of recoiled in horror at the thing. I said, I'm going to have to show Michelle this. So uh, as our order for the ice cream was coming through, I said, I got something I need to show you. And so we're walking through the parking lot. There's the spider that is right next to her. It's that moment of anticipation where you just, you, you know you've got her, and you, you just you begin to just, Okay, maybe I'm the only one, but I don't think so, uh, that has this. How close does God let Moses get before he speaks out of the burning bush and says, Moses? And you can just imagine, it's a miracle that he didn't just wet himself right there. Maybe he did, and the text just doesn't reveal it. But it's, it's one of the few places in the Bible where I really do think it's kind of a funny scene. All right, here we go. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, he led his flock beyond the wilderness. All right, what it says in Hebrew is behind the wilderness, which doesn't make any sense at all. I think this is Hebrew for middle of nowhere. So, you know, not to the left of nowhere, but right in the middle of nowhere, whatever our expression means there. It says, he led his flock to the middle of nowhere and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing. Yet it was not consumed. All right, I actually love verse 3. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. To whom is Moses speaking? <laughs> it's Moses and a bunch of sheep. And he sees the bush and he's, I must turn aside and see this thing. It's like, you, you are in the middle of nowhere and you've been there a little bit too long, buddy. Uh, so he's talking to the sheep at this point. Okay, um, I love that. It says, and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. I bet he did. Um, <laughs> I, when they reinvented Hebrew uh, as a modern language to be spoken, the people who did this were pious people. And so they did not reinvent any profanity. Well, people are going to curse. And so what Hebrew did was it borrowed all of the Arabic curse words. Um, and so I don't know what Moses said, but he probably threw in an Arabic curse word before he said, here I am. Um, he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. Quite odd is that um, it refers to Moses being on holy ground and says, remove your, the sandals from your feet because you are on holy ground. For the most part, the Bible does not do holy ground. The Bible does holy time, not holy space. Now, you might think, well, wait a minute, what about the Holy of Holies or the, the tabernacle and such? As an illustration, if it's the tabernacle, you know, they, they set up the curtain that's around it, and then they put the tent that's in the middle of it, and the tent...
And yet when God removes His presence, you go in, you pack the thing up, stick it on the back of a donkey, and take it to the next spot. It's not the spot that's holy. It's God's presence that makes it holy. This is the first time in Scripture that the word holy is used. It's interesting. There is one other place where they don't use the adjective, kodesh, holy, but they do use the verb to sanctify, really the vaikadesh, which is the same, uh, uh, same root word there. And where that comes up is in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. God sanctifies the Sabbath. It's the only thing actually in the entire creation week that is declared to be holy, it's set apart and sanctified, is a period of time. What God does is He doesn't so much sanctify place as He sanctifies times in here. What is it that makes this place holy? It's because God is spot. And He's really saying, it's not the ground that's holy, Moses. I'm the one who's holy. You're in my presence. Take your shoes off. You know, this is something that is preserved in Islam even today. If you go into a mosque, you take your shoes off. Uh, before... Uh, there were a lot of political difficulties. We had the opportunity to go in the Al-Aqsa Mosque uh, when we were up on the, the, the Temple Mount there. It's the first thing you do is you take your shoes off. When you get ready to go in there, it's a sign of respect. You know, the, the priestly garments in Israel are described in elaborate detail, and yet they never mention their footwear. It's possible, in fact, I think it's probably likely that the priests did their service barefoot. Now, for us, sometimes that seems like it's something that's disrespectful. But in many cultures, taking your shoes off is the way that you show respect. If you're in a, a Japanese home, for example, taking your shoes off when you go inside, that kind of thing, God is saying to Moses, Moses, I'm here. This is holy ground because I'm here. This is the way that you show respect. And Moses shows respect in far more than just taking off his sandals. He hides his face because he's afraid to look at God. Here he, he can definitely see the fire, and yet once he knows this fire is of a divine origin, he averts his eyes and says, no, I, I, I can't look at this. Isn't that when even Paul, you know when Paul has his vision in the New Testament, he said, I, I know a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I know not. And he was carried up to the third heaven, and there he heard things which it is not lawful to speak of. There's this sense of awe and holiness in their regard for God that says, this is someone I shouldn't even look at here. Um, you know, it's, there's a, well, I'm a, I'm a, uh, uh, Small d Democrat, meaning as opposed to, um, you know, uh, being a Brit, um, you know, July 4th is a great day for me. We, we cast off, you know, the royalty that's over there. But one of the, uh, the uh, effects of our not being in a monarchy anymore is we lose the trappings of what it means to treat God as king. God in the Bible is sort of the ultimate sovereign, the ultimate potentate who's there, the ultimate king. And because we come from a culture which is this, you know, sort of a, a republic where we have a democracy, we, we, don't, we don't have such a thing. You know, the closest we get to it is saying, you know, Mr. President, that kind of idea. We, we don't have that sort of background of bowing or curtsying or, you know, there's that wonderful scene in the movie The Madness of King George where uh, the, the gentleman who has just shown the papers and had the king sign them and now he has to leave his presence. And so he walks backwards like this for what seems like a hundred feet to get away from this notion of not turning your back on the king. That kind, if you've seen the movie The Queen, you know, when they bring the uh, Tony Blair into the presence and there's this elaborate ritual about how one, we, we just don't have that. Now, politically, I'm glad we don't have it. Religiously, we've probably lost something because we don't really have that idea of God being king over us. God is friend. God can be buddy. God can be parent. We don't have a great deal of God is king in our minds. This is a passage where Moses is acting as if he is before the ultimate potentate of the world in here. It says, if we continue on in verse 7, Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. 
I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, now here they translated it right. I know their sufferings. I felt, I have experienced, I am intimately aware of their sufferings. I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians, to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come before me. I have seen how the Egyptians oppress them. And you can imagine Moses at this point going, yes, this, I, I, I am glad to hear that the memo has finally made it to you. Good, that's good, yes, excellent. I, I wonder, are you alerting everyone individually by burning bush that this is something that you have experienced here? That's great. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh. And it's that point that Moses, <laughs> okay, <laughs> back the truck up here, um, hold on. What do you mean I will send you to Pharaoh? It is difficult to conceive of a greater difference in power than the difference between Ramses II and Moses, where Moses is at this moment. At this point, Ramses is the most powerful human being ever to have lived up to that moment. Now, there'll be other people in the future who will be more powerful than he. But up to this moment, he's the most powerful person ever to have lived. And Moses is a poor shepherd on the backside of the wilderness with a bunch of sheep. You could not create a circumstance, hardly, I guess, where you have two characters farther removed from one another in terms of power. I am the least likely human being on earth for you to pick God to go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Why in the world would he listen to me? God has chosen Moses. He has told him, you're going to do this. Moses is going to begin to object to this idea. I frankly am on Moses' side. I think when Moses begins to lodge objections, those objections are really quite valid. That he's going to say, God, well, you know what his first objection is. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Now, in one respect, this is the kind of objection that a prophet is supposed to offer when they're called. There's actually, a, as a scholars have studied prophetic calls, they see that there's a kind of routine to them. It's what they would, the, the term is technically called a gatung or a form. There's a certain kind of structure to the narrative that's there where God calls and what the prophet is supposed to do is first to resist that call. And one of the things they almost always do is they're supposed to say something about their mouth as they resist. And then God comes in and reassures them, and then finally the prophet goes. Now, it kind of makes sense if you think about it. You, you have ever had a, a gift that someone has given you, and you had no intentions whatsoever of refusing the gift, and yet you go, oh, you shouldn't have. Oh, this is, this is too much. I mean, I couldn't possibly. And yet if the person, you know, tried to take it away, you would hold on to it like grim death and say, well, I didn't mean that. Um, you, you, you. You do want the gift, but you're, you're not supposed to say, oh, well, it's about time. That kind of fits what I thought I was worth. You're supposed to resist to some degree. When, uh, when someone is called as a prophet, the first thing they do is they, they resist. Now, you know of a story that's similar to this. Think about the call of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. I saw the Lord, you know, high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple and so forth. He says, woe is me for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. In other words, he's saying something. I'm not worthy. Uh, I, my mouth in particular is not worthy. And it says that God takes or the angel takes them and says, you're, frankly, you know, you kind of nailed it. You're nobody. I, you're, you're, it, it's interesting when you look at the way God responds to Moses. It does not say a word about Moses. 
He, he doesn't say, well, you know, Moses, you were really popular back in high school when you were at Cairo High. Everybody, I mean, you were like the, the, the prom king and everybody wanted to date you and both the Egyptians. It doesn't say a word about that. Says, you know, Moses, you are fantastic. You know what, Moses, you're powerful. You're compassionate. You know, he doesn't say any of those kinds of things when Moses says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Look at God's response to him. This is verse 11. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I will be with you. That's really all you need, Moses. Because this isn't about you. This is about me. I'm the one that's going to do the exodus, not you. You're, you're the instrument that I'll use to do it. But Moses, this is about who I am, not about who you are. I'll be with you. Now, Moses is going to break the pattern of prophetic resistance because usually you just resist a little bit and then you acquiesce. Moses is going to keep pushing. And his next comment here, notice what he says. It says, um, verse 13, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Now, I've mentioned to you before that name in Hebrew, it's not just your title. Name is your reputation. Moses' second objection has an edge to it. He has said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And God has said back, it's okay, Moses, I'll be with you. And Moses has said to God, yeah, so who are you? You remember chapters 1 and 2? where God did nothing for the Israelites. Moses is calling God out on his reputation. He's saying, oh, that's fine. You're going to be with me? So what's your reputation? Where have you been? Now, one of the ways that we can figure out that Moses' question has an edge is the fact that God's response has an edge too. You remember the way he responds, right? I am who I am. You tell him I am sent you. That's one of those kind of bark backs that gets a yes, sir. Um, you know, it's God responds to Moses with a little bit more vehemence there because God perceives the nature of Moses' objection. That's great. You're going to be with me. So who are you? Where have you been, lo, these many years while we've been descending into slavery? What's your reputation? And that's why God's response back is, I am who I am. You tell him I am sent you. Now, I'll, I'll clarify something for you, and it'll be hard for me to do because I flatly just do not say the divine name. Um, I got my education at a Jewish school, and so I just don't do it. Um, I, don't, I don't say the divine name. What I will say is the word Jehovah. So let me give you a little bit of a, a kind of side uh, a note here about this. The word I am, or I am who I am, is not the definition of the divine name, the Y-H-W-H -H name that's there. Um, there is a sound play between the two, uh, but to say I am is the word eh and that's not how you say that other name. The, uh, the divine name is one that probably ultimately goes back to the word creator. Uh, in fact, uh, the great scholar from Harvard, uh, Frank Moore Cross, has argued that it's probably an epithet where God was called El Du Yahwe, and that means God who creates, God who causes to be. It's technically be a third person hifil form of the verb hava to be. Um, so God is the one who brings things into being. Uh, if you ever watch the movie Noah, you'll notice that in that movie they call God the creator. Well, you can just get that out of thin air. That's probably what this, uh, this name means. Um, and so the, the name means creator. Eventually, though, it becomes a name that is treated as so holy, so sacred, that um, Jews have said, we just should not say this name at all. And all that is is sort of thinking through the, the commandment and the Ten Commandments. It says, don't use this name for an ordinary purpose. That's what the text means when it says, don't take this name in vain. You know, the first thing that pops in my head is like profanity. But it doesn't really have anything to do with what that command is about. What it's saying is, this is something that's special. 
It ought to be set aside as special. Don't use it for an ordinary that would merit using this name. We're, we're just not going to say it. When you get to the New Testament, this uh, is already sort of well underway. You notice that when Jesus prays, he's, he says, Our Father, doesn't actually call him uh, directly by his name, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's just fancy old English for let your name be holy. Holy means set aside. Let your name be set aside for special occasions. Even Jesus in the Lord's Prayer is saying this isn't an ordinary name. It ought to be set aside. If you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, the, it, there are numerous Dead Sea Scrolls in which they're just writing along in their particular sort of uh, handwriting they use in there. And then all of a sudden they'll stop and they'll go back to a different script, the one that they used hundreds of years before, and they'll write the divine name, those four characters called the Tetragrammaton, just in those four characters. It's their way of saying, this is something special. We're, we're not going to use this. Now, I know it may seem odd to think, well, why? In fact, I've had people say this to me before. Why would you not say the name of your deity, the name of your God? I mean, this is the person you're supposed to be the closest to. Why would you not do it? And I say, you haven't thought this through. I assume you have parents. Yes, yes, I do. And what do you call them? Well, I've, I've only met one or two, and I've taught thousands of students. I've only met one or two who call their parents by their first names. I am not sure I have ever called my father Jim. I, I don't think I ever have. I have jokingly called my mom Cheryl before or in a crowd where I knew that if I said mom that I would get, you know, every head, <laughs> you know, turned toward me. I, I've said Cheryl two or, or three times. I, my parents have perfectly good names. And I never called them by those names. And it's not because I don't love my parents. I love my parents dearly. It's just the way that I show respect to my parents. If my, if my sons deigned to call me Jeff, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, we can go back to ages one through three and uh, figure this out again. It just, uh, it, it just doesn't happen. It's not because they don't love me. I mean, I'm, I'm fantastic. Of course they love me. It's, it's, well, in humble, I mean, uh, those, <laughs> awesomeness and humility, those are my two spiritual gifts. Um, so, all right, that was pretty good, actually, wasn't it? It's not a matter of distance. It's a matter of respect, frankly, in not using the divine name. Now, there was a Christian who didn't read Hebrew very well, and he messed up the divine name, and he bailed us out on this. So there's no way to really explain this without drawing it up on a board, but I'll give it a shot. When I talk to my dad, I don't say Jim, I say dad, okay? If I were like reading his name, I would still say dad, Adonai. That means Lord. And they said, well, how could we pull this off? Well, we're not going to erase. It wasn't a sign for you to pronounce it in this weird way like Yehovah or something. You're supposed to see that and say Adonai. That's, that's, it's like the marker. It's just like if you put that funny S with the two lines through it at the beginning of a number, you know, like say the number 100, you're not supposed to look at that and go, slew. No, you're supposed to say $100. When you, when you put that, that other one, it's got like a, a circle and a line and another, you're not supposed to say, oh, 100 Olo. No, it's 100%. They're trying to tell you something. This is the signal that you say something else when you get to this. You're not supposed to go Mers, as in Mers Jones. You're supposed to say Mrs. That's what that stands for there. It's, you're supposed to see the divine name and say Adonai. In English, you're supposed to say Lord. Well, somebody didn't realize that, and so they read it as if it were a real name. Well, if you take Yehovah and run it through the German washing machine, it becomes Jehovah. When you say Jehovah, what you're doing is you're really just kind of mispronouncing the divine name that's in there. But the beauty of it is, now you know exactly what name I'm talking about, and I'm not saying the divine name when I do it. So Jehovah is the term that I'll use here. This term is a word play on I am. God is saying to Moses, my very name contains within it the notion that my presence 
will be with you. Moses, I can be anywhere I want to. I can do anything I want to. And what I have chosen at this moment is that I will be with you. I am who I am. I create everything. And I have chosen, Moses, that I'll be with you. You're going to do this, and I'm going to be the one who does it through you. Moses has objected, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? He has objected basically, well, God, who are you? You, you, you say that you're going to do this. His third objection is going to be one more step down that trail of having a tone. He's going to say, well, what if they don't believe me? You notice he doesn't actually mention Pharaoh. <laughs> he doesn't say, what if Pharaoh isn't willing to let them go? What he's more worried about is the people seemingly. He says, well, what if they won't believe me? And so God says, all right, I've got three signs for you. Here's the first sign. Take your staff, throw it down, and it becomes a snake. A snake, <laughs> a snake, that'd be awesome. Um, he, he then says, okay, take your hand and stick it in your cloak. And when it comes back out, it's leprous. And then he says, take water and pour it out, and it becomes blood. These are these signs. You do these for the Israelites, and they'll believe you. You know what's interesting about those signs? Those signs come up later. When Pharaoh doesn't believe Moses, God turns the water into uh, blood. A little bit later on, when Miriam challenges Moses' leadership and says, I don't really think God has put you in control. I think it, it's me and, and Aaron who should be. God turns her completely leprous. And a, a little bit later still, when the Israelites don't believe God, God sends snakes among them. All three of these circumstances, places where people are questioning God's leadership. Who's questioning God's leadership now? It's Moses who's doing it. These are signs that are saying, Moses, the real problem's not the people standing right here. The real problem is you. You're the one who isn't believing me. It's Moses' hand that has just become leprous. It's Moses' staff that has just become a snake. This is God saying, Moses, the one who needs to get on board with this plan right now is not Pharaoh. It's not the people. I'll take care of them. The one who needs to get on board with this plan right now is you, Moses. Who am I? Who are you? What if they don't believe me? And then there's that next objection that comes up a, a little bit later in the text. It says, uh, if you go to, this is actually in chapter 4, um, it says, uh, verse 10, but Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past, nor even now that you have spoken to your servant. <laughs> I love that. No, nor in the last five minutes uh, while we've been having this conversation. I haven't suddenly become, you know, Themistocles or something. Um, I, I have... Uh, I, I have I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor even now that you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. The word slow in here is the same word that's used for Pharaoh's heart. It's the word heavy. When it says that Pharaoh is hard-hearted, what it really says is that he is heavy Hearted. That's the Hebrew version of the expression. And you know what it means when it's related to Pharaoh. It means that Pharaoh is being stubborn. Moses has just said, although he didn't really mean to say it, God, I, I've, I've never been eloquent. I'm stubborn of tongue and stubborn of mouth. It's a self-admission that he's being stubborn in this case. And notice God's response. It says, Then the Lord said to him, Who gives speech to mortals? Who makes them mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to speak. Moses has just admitted, without really meaning to admit it, God, I'm being stubborn. And Moses, I'm sorry, the Lord has agreed. Yes, Moses, in fact, you are being stubborn. And I've had just about all of the stubbornness I intend to take. I made you the way that you are. Go. 
and I'll be with your mouth, and I'll be with your speech. It's not about you, Moses. It's about me. Now, the next line, the next objection is not really an objection. The next objection is a refusal. Verse 13, he said, Oh, my Lord, send someone else. That's not who am I. That's not who are you. That's not what if they don't believe. That's not I'm not a good speaker. That's, yeah, I'm good. Um, send somebody else. Thank you for asking, you know, but uh, um, not today. Um, just somebody else can take care of this. And there's an interesting line in response. It says, then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. This has degenerated from a legitimate objection, who am I, to a series of illegitimate, about a minute left here, but I want to uh, see if I can give you just a little introduction to something very odd in the text and the way that it ends. It seems like all of a sudden God has moved from his anger being kindled against Moses to just the happiest kind of conclusion you can imagine. Oh, here's Aaron. Aaron's a great speaker. He'll speak for you, and uh, you, you'll be like God, and, and he'll be like your prophet. We're good. And then Moses decides that he'll go. It's the most unsatisfactory ending to the text. And there's a reason for it. It's, this is one of the places where when they did the editing, Aaron kind of got moved to the forefront a little bit more quickly than he should have. If we pull Aaron out of there for a moment and read the text, we get this incredibly odd story in chapter 4. It says that Moses is, is spending the night in the wilderness. It says, and the Lord attacked him and sought to kill him. Now that doesn't make any sense at all in the context where it is, because it looks like he's on his way to Egypt. It makes a great deal of sense if we stick it right after that verse, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. I think in the original form of the story, Moses has finally just said, I'm not going. And God has said, we're going to put that one to the test. And so God attacks Moses in the wilderness and says, we're going to work this out one way or the other. It's actually, it's a parallel to the story of Jacob. Remember, he's going to do this. And that's the moment that Mo Moses finally does break and submits to this. Moses, I think, is a, a study in the way God interacts with people through the Bible again and again and again. In fact, I think one of the, the greatest sort of culminations of this is the experience that we see with Paul. You remember Paul? He's going the opposite way of the direction that God wants him to go. And God steps in and when Jesus appears to him in the book of Acts, he's got just the most wonderful kind of line that he says to him. In the King James, it says, uh, uh, Paul, it's hard for you to kick against the goads, which makes no sense whatsoever in modern English. What he's saying is, you're kicking against the cattle prod that I'm using to direct you in the path I want you to go. Paul you're running just as fast as you can the opposite direction. And I am sitting here prodding you, telling you to go back this way. And you're going, but you're only going to go kicking and screaming. But you're going to go. And from the moment that Paul submits, he finally gives in. Everything just breaks, and it's good. I think of this, and I'll close with this. It's that moment to go back to an earlier illustration with the kids, you've all had that moment where they are kicking and screaming and whining and crying and defiant, and finally they just give out and they break. And they just collapse into your arms and they usually fall asleep because of all of the emotion that they've spent. And the difference from that child, my goodness, it's like the, the poor demoniac there, at the, the garrison demoniac, from you know, raging and screaming and yanking and breaking fetters to sitting there clothed and in his right mind. From the moment that Paul submits, Paul is a changed person. From the moment that Moses finally breaks and submits, He's a changed person. 
he will go from who am I that I should go to Pharaoh to walking boldly into Pharaoh's palace and saying, let my people go. Every person in the Exodus is going to have to have this experience. They're going to kick and they're going to scream, but God's not going to give up because of the first thing we talked about this morning, and God knew. From the moment he felt their pain, the Exodus was already a done deal. It's just a matter of people getting in line and doing what God said. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your word. I pray that you'll bless it and help us to follow the, the submission of Moses and not his rebellion. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.